namo tathā bhagavato arahato sammā sambuddhassa namo tathā bhagavato arahato sammā sambuddhassa namo tathā bhagavato arahato sammā sambuddhassa Aparuta de Sangamatasa Tawara, ye Tora Wanta, Bamunchan to Satang. Well, this is the full moon night of uh, January two thousand five. We've all uh, renewed our Thila commitment and this is uh, the vehicle, earthly vehicle that we're using for boundaries, commitments to restraint in regards to action and speech. <coughs> you know, the, you, know the, you request, you, when you become a bhikkhu, you have to request three times to be accepted and then uh, train under the Vinaya, so forth. And lay people have to ask for the eight precepts. So this, this conveys uh, how sila is regarded or morality as something we request, not something imposed on us. So it's, it's a voluntary thing. It's not to intimidate or to attach to the convention, but to uh, see the value of restraint in order to uh, be mindful. If we have no, if we don't know our boundaries in regards to action and speech, then we, we tend to, you know, cause a lot of more confusion to ourselves and others. So if we just follow impulses and desires, forces of habit, uh, as we go along, then uh, without any any kind of uh, conventional reflection on any any limitation on behavior then we it's hard to get any perspective so say in the samana life the the foundation is the sila and this is this is on the conventional level of living in a human form living in a community in which we uh, we have to live together as samanas here, and the commitments we have, uh, we, uh, we re renew every fortnight. Just to remind ourselves of what, what we are doing, what, what's the purpose of our life? Why is a, what is a, a samana? So it is a time is a, uh, in the in the worldly life where uh, there aren't any any kind of boundaries necessary. Kind of we, you know, not to just try to not break the law too much or whatever. But on the worldwide level, there's no international agreements on say moral conduct, and so you get all kinds of different views and opinions, uh, hard line approaches. Uh, such as fundamentalist attitudes from theistic religions. People seem to, at a time where there's a lot, the things seem so uncertain uh, and there's so much fear in the world, then people revert to kind of more primitive ways of, of uh, that they remember where, you know, the kind of reward punishment practices and the kind of like a, is is god sending 
retribution when he when he when the tsunami hit the Indian Ocean. And then you hear people discussing is it, is it God's punishment for for human sinfulness and a kind of of uh, dialogues going on in regards to this from both Muslims and Christians. But this isn't, you know, for in terms of Buddhism, sila is not a matter of reward and punishment. It's, a, it's an aid to awareness, to awakening. It, it establishes a kind of, of a conventional vehicle that we can use, not for identity and not for uh, attachment, but for reflection. So that's the whole point of, of our life, is to witness and observe the mental state, the experience of here and now as it is, as each individual is experiencing this moment. So we all have our karma, so each one of us is has our own kind of unique character, personality, tendencies, habits, preferences, prejudices, and so forth. So these are reflected in consciousness if we if we are willing to observe and witness in this moment the way it is. So consciousness then is what we're experiencing right now, and then the, this is the reality of consciousness. Each one of us is a conscious being. And then what arises in consciousness can be, you know, very different from what is what rising in mind right now and what you're thinking or feeling at this moment in quality or whatever can be very, very different, very opposite, very, you know, unique eccentric, conventional, or whatever. But that which is aware, see, with, as a conscious being, as a, and a human being, we have the ability to observe, witness, and reflect in this present moment. So we know we can observe what we are feeling, physically, emotionally, So this is what we mean by sati sampatanya, mindfulness, intuitive awareness, uh, apprehension, apperception. Uh, an intuitive awareness then is uh, our ability in this moment, uh, everything that is impinging on us, that's happening for us at this moment. So it, it's not a, it's not a, a kind of discriminative thing. It's not like seeking out anything, but just noticing that this moment is like this. The body is like this. The breath is like this. The mental state is like this. Well, if we start thinking about it, <coughs> you know, when, we, when we're caught in the thinking process in our intellect, then we, we start analyzing. We just notice maybe, I don't feel very good tonight, or I feel really good, or, you know, I feel, w you know we might, uh, we, we can grasp the particular experience, the emotional experience we're having, or, or just out of habit resist, or any kind of uh, physical sensations that might be unpleasant, or, or just get caught in aversion, or trying to get rid of them. That's a force of habit, habitual tendencies is we, we've developed in our lives, and, uh, and these habits tend to take us over. 
So in, with meditation, we're actually learning to uh, free ourselves from just the force of habit by awakening and receiving whatever is happening at this moment. So that can be, you know, in, in, an, in, an intuitive moment includes everything. It's not just what looking at one thing and ignoring the rest. So it's uh, to, to really develop confidence in this intuitive awareness, uh, then it's, a, it's a, our ability to open and be receptive in this very moment. It's not trying to concentrate, put our attention on anything in particular, but uh, our ability to say, open to this moment as is. Relax, in other words, a sense of relaxed awareness, receptivity. As then we're not, we're not trying to, to uh, find anything or get anything from it, but learn to, to recognize uh, an innate ability, a natural ability we have as human individuals that is the way of liberation. Because it's only through this way that we can free ourselves from the force of habit that we have or the, the uh, suffering that we create. The main point of meditation then is to recognize or realize this natural state. When the Buddha was talking about awareness, mindfulness, mindfulness, the path through the deathless, this isn't a created state of mind. And it's not a compounded state that we create through controlling or concentrating. It's a natural state of being that we tend to forget or not or forgotten all about. Mm. Though and many of us have started out with all kinds of ideas about meditation and Buddhism and concentration and g getting states and so forth, so that our emphasis has been on achieving or attaining. Because this is how most of us are conditioned by our societies. And that we we're in from societies where the education and the the uh, the attitude of a society is towards progress, attainment, achievement, and so this very this mindset we bring into sangha life, thinking we're going to get something from it. So this is where we, this reflective ability is encouraged. Uh, I mean, we can think, if I keep all the rules, the moral precepts, and uh, practice hard, then I'll get something for that. I'll be rewarded in some way for do it, doing all the right things. So this is the still very much the self-view operating. Like if you're a good boy, you get you you get uh, a reward if you're a good student. You you get uh, praise for that, and so forth. And if you're bad, then you get criticized. <coughs> but still, the ignorance is a, is a very sense of a self. It's being somebody that's got to get something, or or get rid of something. How many of you? approach meditation idea of getting rid of anger or lust or fear, things like this. Idea of getting rid of the defilements in order to become enlightened. These are, you know, average ways of thinking, natural ways of thinking that we we uh, we sometimes never question, never see through, we that we operate from. 
So that's why I keep emphasizing this uh, sati sampachanya sati panya. Because this is not, uh, this is the, when we begin to recognize or realize this natural state of being here and now, it's so normal that we don't notice. When you become a person, a personality, then you're, then you're, you're no longer normal. You become something else. So I remember we used to talk about normal person uh, as uh, some kind of, uh, you know, thing that we should try to aim for, to be normal. And somebody who's abnormal is uh, kind of, you don't get too close to them, they're abnormal. But if they're normal, that, that sense gives a sense of being safe and acceptable. But when you really contemplate uh, what ignorance, desire, and attachment, what that creates, even even what is considered normal in a society is abnormal. In other words, we're living in societies that are abnormal, basically. <laughs> They're all crazy. Everybody's crazy, actually. Until you recognize what is normal, the norm, or the Dhamma. So that during this winter's retreat, the, the encouragement is to, is to trust yourself during this. This is a special opportunity. Conditions are very, very good here and very, uh, you know, the support, the situation, the time, the place, and the teaching, the emphasis that I'm making is not for attaining, trying to get rid of your defilements or attain concentrated states, but to awaken and trust in your, it's a natural ability, it's not a fantastic feat uh, that only uh, very advanced kind of human beings could ever hope to achieve. That is another abnormal view. You know, talk about sati sampachanya, it's, these are the Pali words, and, uh, and this is the kind of, this is the, the very essence of the Buddha's teaching. Mindfulness, awareness, awakeness. The very word Buddha means awake, means human being who's awake. And this awakeness is, uh, is, is, is a, a real awakeness, not just a kind of, because your eyes are open and you're kind of, you're conscious. But you can still be lost in the in the the realm of your own thoughts and views and emotional habits, and you think you're awake. <coughs> but in terms of Bhutto or Buddha, this awakeness is this sati sampachanya. It's the ability that each one of us has in, in this human form. Uh, to reflect, to observe. So, just like, like right now, observing the way it is. And of course, I, you know, when again you, one starts with the body or the breath, that which is uh, quite obvious and, and uh, at this moment, the breathing, anapanasati, or the posture, of uh, the four postures, sitting, standing, walking, lying down. But it's not to, to uh, don't make it into any kind of, of exercise or create it into anything, but just observe the breath, inhalations like this, exhalations like this. That which is aware of an inhalation
who is it or what is it that's aware they, uh, when you're inhaling and exhaling or sitting? So you're, you know, it's not a matter of an analyzing why you're breathing or whether you're breathing in the right way or the wrong way or whatever, but because it's not, this isn't to, to make value judgments about what's happening right now, but observing. So the way it is, Pali, da da da, they have this word da da da, means the way it is, as isness, suchness. Which is, uh, you know, putting the, using this word is it just is not a definition. It's not pointing. It's not a, a you know a judgment of anything. It's just the a way of thinking that helps that might help you to observe to remind you to to be the observer. rather than be somebody who's trying to meditate. <coughs> so the, the breath, the body, the observe the, just, the, you know, the, be the puto, the puto that sees the, what kind of mental state, you know, you emotionally right now, what's the quality of your Emotional state, you know, as you feel happy, sad, uh, full of faith and inspiration, or full of doubt and despair, or whatever, you know, just what is it that can observe? If you're feeling doubtful and uncertain, what is it that observes this? So by questioning like this, you know, say, what is it, or who, who is it, or what is it? What can observe this feeling of dis-ease, or anger, or uh, tension, or whatever your experience is? So this is, this is a way of reflecting, of, of awakening to to the way it is, but it's not, it's not a judgment. So whatever way you're feeling is not, the point is not to, to uh, put it some kind of value judgment on it, but just recognize all that's necessary is receiving it, letting it be what it is, rather than being caught in the habits of trying to, if, if we think, if we're in a bad mood, and then we, we observe this, then we, you know, we don't, even bad mood is too much. It is what it is. <laughs> and I just call it a bad mood, then that, that, that's making it more than what it is. But this is, this is just a, a way of speaking. If one is in a, in a kind of grumpy mood, what is it that knows that this, that this mood is this way? then the habit tendency might be to try to get rid of it. You know, if you're trying to uh, suppress it, uh, get rid of something you don't like, that, that's maybe your habit tendency. If you feel like this, you automatically kind of impulsively try to, to avoid it, distract yourself. Or you just follow it. You just start feeling grumpy and and critical, and then you just everything you everyone everyone you see you you find something wrong with, and you just indulge in in your critical faculties. Because when you're when I'm in a bad mood, grumpy mood, everything I see there's something wrong with it. Even if it's a sunny day, you know, grump is too sunny or <laughs> because uh, that the grasping the grumpy mood as some kind of out of habit, you know, then everything is is tinged by that, you know. So that's why it distorts the present moment, and you 
you see, you experience life through this distortion. But if you trust yourself to awaken to it, it is what it is. Receive it. Let it be what it is. Which is neither indulging in it or trying to get rid of it, but being patient, accepting, receptive. And moods of any sort, or they arise, they cease. They're very impermanent. And you begin to, to know how to let go, how to release yourself, how to free yourself from emotional habits and, and fears and desires that, that um, cause you so much unhappiness in your life. Now, the critical mind is, uh, you know, that's what we're, um, our education, isn't it? Is where it, what modern education about is, is all about knowing what is the, the best and the worst and what should and shouldn't be and, and uh, which is bigger and smaller and so forth. So, so this is a, a function that we have. Uh, intellectual abilities to to compare to analyze and there's nothing wrong with this this is I'm not cri criticizing uh, our critical faculties I was trying to point to, to it as uh, and to begin to look at it for what it is rather than be caught into it lost into it identified with believing it And so much about discontentment, you know, in the holy life, isn't it? Uh, even in in places like this or any monastery that I've ever lived in, you know, if if I operate, if I let my critical faculty take over, then then uh, there's always something wrong, something shouldn't should be shouldn't be. Uh, you know, the the mind will always seek and and kind of grasp the the things I don't like or don't want. Or it might go the other way. I refuse to notice anything like that and just try to convince myself this is the best monastery in the whole world and our teacher is the best teacher and, and our form of Buddhism is the best and, and Buddhism is the best and, and then we try to suppress any negative feeling by by grasping uh, these kind of affirmations of our, we have the best. But that also is, uh, you know, suffering. Just desperately trying to affirm everything is, is, uh, is based on ignorance, not understanding, so inevitably it leads to, you can only sustain it for a while and then it falls apart. So, but with awareness, then the, the spectrum of positive and negative, good and bad, right and wrong, is received in the same moment. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, with no preferences, but it certainly knows things as they are. It's, it's discerning, it's wisdom, panya. And the discerning ability uh, in Panya then is I in terms of uh, meditation like Vipassana is, uh, is development of the Panya faculty. Insight into the way things are. The all conditions are impermanent. So this isn't an intellectual exercise by just projecting the ideal of impermanence onto everything you see, hear, smell, taste, touch, and think. Sometimes we do that. We say, the Buddha said all conditioned phenomena is impermanent. So then we, we just say, oh, you know, uh, everything, this temple is impermanent, uh, the weather is impermanent, the seasons are impermanent, everything is impermanent. The faith on Karani Shah. But actually, what we're doing is we're grasping the teaching. All conditions are impermanent. And then we project that onto experience. 
But that's not satisampachanya. And that's not liberating just to convince yourself everything is impermanent. What this is pointing to is observing impermanence, just like in just one inhalation. Just something is obviously impermanent is an inhalation. But it's not to say an inhalation is impermanent, but to to really be with the impermanence of it from its beginning to its ending. So you're you're learning to sustain your attention, putting your attention, witnessing something very obvious. But you're not trying to convince yourself it's impermanent because you're 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 observing impermanence. You don't have to to say it or or believe it. It is this is the way it is. Impermanent is like this and Nietzsche. I also observed, you know, in in observing my breath, how easy it is to concentrate on an inhalation and how easy it is to wander on the exhalation. I don't know about you, but I used to see this. I, I had no problems concentrating fully on an inhalation. Then I noticed the exhalation, my mind tends to wander. Oh, start thinking about something. So just observing, you know, that, that uh, some things, you know, like the rising state isn't it? When we're interested, when we're fascinated, when we're, we have faith and so forth. It's just the sense of inspiration or inhalation. That's the kind of ri- a, a rising side that it somehow in, is it, uh, say interests us. or we, It's easy to, s- to be with it. And then in its decaying state, we tend to look for something else. Now this is just from my own reflections, so don't don't think you have to see things like I do, just sharing what I've learned just from watching my breath. Or the body. (coughs) You know the one, the the, po- the four postures. At first, when they said, "Be aware of the body and the body and and that of the posture," I found that quite difficult because uh, it had been a way of of experiencing a physical body I'd never even thought of. I'd use my body for exercises, uh, sports, fitness training. Uh, all kinds of things, you know, vanity and so forth, and seen it in, in all these different ways. But just to be aware of the body as it is, as an experience right now, sitting is like this. And then my, my mind would think, well, what, what is it? You know, I don't feel anything special, just, you know. Should I be experiencing something? You know, what am I supposed to be experiencing if I'm just sitting, standing, walking, lying down? Because it is kind of a totally new way of of experiencing one's own body, as far as I was concerned. And suddenly the the penny dropped. Click. Yeah, it's just the way it is. Sitting. The body sitting. And I began to just notice the the, the the feeling of pressure or the body, and, you know, as, as I open to the reality of, of sitting, then it I began to notice the sensations and so forth that were were quite obvious, but ignored when I was trying to f- think I should be experiencing something, and I already had in mind or some doubt or idea that I should. What am I supposed to be experiencing if I'm sitting? So intuitive awareness embraces the whole body, the breath, the mood, sensory impingement, whatever, all in the same moment. 
You know, it's a it's a holistic, as they say, modern New Age jargon, holistic ex- reality or oneness. And then you talk about experience of oneness. When you start thinking, you you automatically divide things up, don't you? Thought is a divisive ability we have. It divides. And we're trained to think and we're identified with, with our thoughts and our memories. But if you really notice what thinking does, it's its function is to divide, you know, you and me. That's already uh, operating from from thought. I'm Ajahn Sumedho, you're the Sangha. So, and that on a conventional level is is fair enough. But the, y- then if one is just caught in that way of of relating and experiencing life through divi- through division then, uh, you know, one never, uh, there's always this sense of something inadequate, something to do, you as separate from me, me as I'm the teacher, you're the student, or uh, these kind of roles that we we have on a conventional plane uh, begin to be our identity. But if we recognize awareness doesn't Im- it doesn't need thought. Thought is a I- you know is a condition that arises and ceases. Awareness is a natural state. Before we ever started thinking, we were aware. Awareness then embraces thinking. Thinking arises and ceases. And so recognizing this awareness, realizing this natural state. Now I've pointed to this, uh, what I call sound of silence, because when you begin to notice this resonating vibratory kind of ring, that uh, that's... Uh, that you can't get beyond it. I mean, you've kind of reached that center point. Thinking stops. But if there's still consciousness operating, awareness, there's no, you, you know, there's no sense of a separate self in it. Unless I start thinking. But if I'm just trusting, relaxing into this emptiness, this stillness, this silence. Then you have that perspective on, on thought or emotion, mood, that you might, whatever mood you're in right now. So it's the, like the background to everything, where everything arises and ceases. It's the primal ground or the unconditioned, the amata dhamma that that you begin to recognize. It's not it's not a creation. It's just to be rec- realized or recognized. It's this way. It doesn't seem like much. In terms of, you know, what you might create out of uh, reading scriptures about the Buddha's enlightenment and the earth, tr- you know, shook and the, all the different heavenly realms reverberated and and that, therefore, you, <laughs> you know, you uh, you can create a perception of of uh, enlightenment as being, you know, some kind of you know, fantastic experience because it, you know, the words themselves are extreme in the description. So when we're we're looking for attaining, achieving enlightenment, then all that on this level of of conditions 
and a and a sense of a, a person, personal self, uh, it, it's impossible. You know, sometimes you can, through extreme concentration and control, experience uh, very kind of ecstatic, refined states of consciousness, but you can't sustain them because they depend too much on conditions uh, supporting it. But this this awareness has, doesn't depend on anything. So it's not you know whether you're in this meditation hall or in uh, London traffic jam or in a mountain top in a cave or in on a battlefield. If once you recognize realize this, it's always you know it's, it's the way it is. It's a natural state that isn't destroyed by or lost unless we forget. And that's, that's what we forget. We get distracted into, into conditioned realm again and get wound up into that. So this remembering of this, this simple remembrance, just like the, the mantra Bhutto, isn't it? That's what I've used. Or the word silence. Whenever I hear the word silence, I immediately hear the sound of silence. <laughs> I used to write pages in notebooks. Silence, silence, silence. I have them in my kuti. Just pages of nothing but... Because every time I think the word, the silence is present. <laughs> and and it's interesting, I've when I came back from uh, Thailand recently, I telephoned my sister who lives in uh, the United States. And uh, she'd been very worried about me because of the tsunami uh, earthquake. Uh, and uh, I thought I'd left her my schedule, you know, that I, w w I thought she knew where I was. We were in Burma at the time where you couldn't send any emails or anything, so <coughs> I found out she had been quite uh, concerned, phoned by Geary and, and uh, so forth, so she was very relieved. And so, and anyway, one of the monks from Abhayagiri had b gone to see her and uh, given her the book Intuitive Awareness. I was going to give it to her when I, when I go to the States in June, but but anyway, she, she was reading this book and she was telling me that, and I taught her how to use the sound of silence years ago. <coughs> and she's a devout Roman Catholic, third order Carmelite. She has a special rule that she keeps for householders. And uh, she, uh, and for the past several years, she's had to have a lot of, uh, of uh, dental work, which has, uh, you know, which has been caused a lot of discomfort and so a lot of sensation in her, around her teeth and gums and, and she couldn't uh, hear the sound of silence anymore. And so she kept trying to find the so sound of silence and she couldn't find it and she was quite uh, concerned and then started reading book, Intuitive Awareness, and immediately it was there. <laughs> that was what she told me anyway. <laughs> so this is, uh, <laughs> but it's, you know, the, like in learning to recognize it, in terms of emotional reaction, like it isn't interesting, it isn't, you know, it's boring. What is more boring than the sound of silence? At least your inhalation, you know, has a beginning and ending. And it does get refined, you know, if you concentrate on your breath, you get, you get very refined. And so it can, you know, it's more kind of interesting.
But what I'm pointing to is not not just you know it's not a matter of being interesting, but recognizing, and learning and and being able to receive your own emotional reactions to it. So you you know the, the kind of restlessness it'll bring up. Like for me, and just it's learning to you know I found. Uh, it, my reactions to to this kind of practice were uh, I recognized the value and developed it, but the past few years I mean, incredible restlessness. And uh, and this restlessness, as you you know. It, it you know one wants to do something you know, feel, you know the habit habit of wanting something to do you know wanting something to practice wanting a technique wanting to to have you know like so much of my meditation experience in the beginning was doing things sitting for hours getting samadhi uh you know there's like i was really on a campaign to to conquer Mara and to get something, and and so there's always uh, my meditation was was something I was doing, something you do, and quite compulsive. You know, I've got to meditate. I don't have enough time to meditate. Uh, there's too many things going on. I need to have more time for meditation and all like that. So, so there was uh, this this idea of I'm someone who has to meditate. But as that, that illusion fell away, the sense of me being somebody who has to do it, still uh, there are these strong impulses of uh, these restless feelings of wanting something to do. And that takes the patience. But the important thing is the confidence in this. It's not a matter of getting rid of restlessness either, but in learning to receive it, to notice it, to let it be, not to make problems. And that's where uh, Sangha life is so valuable, I find. You know, like being a Buddhist monk, it's a vehicle for living in because it, uh, it gives a structure to the day, <coughs> community to live with. It um, uh, has a useful function in the society. You know, Amarwati is a highly regarded place and and uh, well supported and so forth. Uh, I mean, it is not just you know living isolated from the world. Uh, people that are interested come and and try it out and so forth so that this this uh you know the the form of of monastic life i think as you you know as you as you access this and develop this awareness so it connects it has a continuity a flow of being present and uh, in you know through the movements of your body through the the morning, you know, the morning puja through, you know, through the day and night, sleeping even, resting, the whole, whole reality of one's existence is included in awareness. And it's not just, you know, three months winter's retreat, formal practices, and sitting in the temple, even though. These are very, this is part of our lifestyle, isn't it? This is, uh, this is part of the, the lifestyle of a tamana, as we, as we regard it here. So we have three month winter's retreat, and, and we have morning, evening pujas, and we have we encourage meditation, sitting meditation, and so forth, walking, jonggom, and that. So the, this is part of a, a lifestyle, part of the the uh, way we live. But it's no longer seen from I have to do it position, a kind of compulsion 
a compulsive attitude towards practice because practice is, isn't something you do, it's a natural flow uh, that one uh, is in, naturally in the moment. So in in then these then these restless feelings, as you recognize them, they they fade out. Part of it is it's a restless realm in the body, one's body. Or there's the the sense impingement. You know, it, it hits you and you startles, and it you know you, you feel you know stimulated or whatever by this and you feel the cold or you feel the wind or or the ha- the momentum of habits of just uh, a lifetime of of you know feeling you have there's something you've got to do you know from uh, my background it is I was brought up to to there is always something to do you should be doing something and there was always a lot of guilt I'd experienced about when I wasn't involved in doing something worthwhile. Like I, I told you about this recurring dream I used to have when I first went to stay with Ajahn Shah, where where I <coughs> I kept having this this dream, and it would be I was going into a coffee shop. And and I'd sit down at a table and and uh, order some coffee, and then this voice would say, "You shouldn't be here. You've got an examination. You should be studying for your exam." <laughs> and of course, you know, I've been, I'd, I'd been very. I kind of had almost a breakdown in graduate school. I was studying so hard. <laughs> Took me six months to recover after I received my MA. <laughs> I couldn't read for about six months because <coughs> I just, you know, I, I just crammed and studied this compulsive uh, tendency to have to to learn all these things to pass the exam, to prove myself. Pass the exam was absolutely necessary for any kind of self-respect. So then this, this dream was, was a, you know, you shouldn't be enjoying just sitting in a cafe drinking a cup of coffee because you've got an exam to take and you should be studying. You're wasting your time. So then I kept thinking, well, you know, here I am, I was at Wat Pong, I was very sincere, very inspired, you know, and I was trying to learn all the Vinaya rules and do everything right and and fit in and learn Thai and and do it all properly and uh, meditate, sit and do walking practice and do it all, you know. So I thought I was really working hard at it, trying my best. But this dream kept saying, you know, you shouldn't, you, you know, the, any moment of just kind of relaxed enjoyment, this, this voice would say, you shouldn't be enjoying this, you've got an exam, there's something, you know, you haven't, you're not prepared for. And when it comes, you know, you've, uh, you won't be ready for it and you'll fail. So uh, anyway, this, I kept thinking maybe I should meditate more, or well, there's something... I, I should do more of that I haven't been doing, and <coughs> then I couldn't see how I could do any more. I was, I was becoming compulsive about monastic life. So, and I kept recurring. I kept having it over and over, and then 
suddenly one t- one time i had I had this dream, and I woke up and I understood what it was telling me, and what it sa- what it really was saying was, there isn't any exile. You've lived your life always as if there was an exam, some great test that you, in the future, that you have to be prepared for. And so any kind of relaxation was, uh, you know, you were wasting your time. You might, you know, you could use this time for serious practice, for study. So I know that in my life, it wasn't that I just well, studied all the time, but I did find myself, you know, especially in university, oftentimes feeling very guilty about, you know, relaxing too much or enjoying things, you know, because there's always this, this inner voice saying, you know, you've, you've got an exam and you've, you're not ready, you've got to, you, you're not, you know, you've got to be ready for it. And then the, because of this reflective ability, rather than taking this dream literally, began to see that was a mistake. That, that I'd lived my life always with this, this perception of there's a big test waiting for you that you're not ready for. That, uh, that is an illusion. That was a, a kind of habit tendency that that I'd acquired. And so I didn't know how to relax or enjoy anything very much. Because, because there is always this, this compulsive feeling of wasting my time. So that, once I realized that, that, that there wasn't an exam, I never had to dream again, you know, like it was, it kept kind of prodding me, jabbing me in the ribs till I, till I recognized what, was, what it actually meant. Now the ego is one that, that operates from that. My, my personality is, if I, if I fall into personal habits, I go, I go immediately into compulsion and guilt. It's just the way the, that's conditioned. It's just the, the way that my personality is a conditioned thing. It, it operates like that. But awareness is aware, uh, you know, aware. The personality arises and ceases. It's not, it has no continuity to it. You know, it ha- my personality changes according to the conditions. So, you know, it's uh, just the way it is. It's not that, uh, you know, there's not such a thing as a permanent personality. Just notice in yourself how your personality will change when you're with your parents or with your best friend or w- at the office or at the monastery or whatever. Personal, uh, you know, when you're under pressure or when you're on a holiday, the personality adapts itself to the uh, contingencies. But that which is aware is not personal, and it's not, it's not mine, I can't claim it as some kind of personal quality. Because to do that, I have to, I have to think, as I am a very mindful monk, and that, that makes no sense. It's like, it doesn't mean anything to think that, because the awareness, is uh, that is the the ground, the background, the unconditioned gate to the deathless. That's where we begin, That's where we find liberation. So I want to encourage you during this retreat to to investigate. Now this takes, you know, investigation, to experiment with yourself to to question, observe, and witness. And whatever it is, you know, uh, whatever you're feeling, and, and, and a lot of 
uh, negative states or or boring states, dullness, doubt, and things like this. They're all part of it. These are conditions that arise and cease. So nothing is, is like a, a waste of time or, you know, an, a real obstruction unless you grasp it. So grasping is the, is clinging, ubadana, is the, is the, is the uh, cause. Out of ignorance we grasp conditioned phenomena and then we're caught once that grasping is seen and that can only be seen through awareness, recognized and through awareness we, we uh, realize non-grasping is liberation. So I offer this as a reflection.